Welcome to the Rise Network Podcast Show, a podcast dedicated to help you reach your dream lifestyle through investing in real estate. We're going to be sitting down with new, intermediate, and experienced investors to talk all about real estate and how it has changed their lives. If you're looking to scale your portfolio or even just get into real estate investing, you're in the right place. Make sure to tune in. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Rise Real Estate Investing Podcast with your host, Mayu Tava and Austin Ye. How's it going, Mayu? Dude, I heard you uh, on the phone right before that you sold the uh, wholesale deal sight unseen. Yes, we did. We did. Or was I just <laughs> bluffing? Huh? Huh? I mean, never know. No, I'm joking. No, we, we actually did sell. Uh, we, we sent out a North Bay deal yesterday and that ended up selling. That was a good deal. I, I thought on your, uh, I saw it come out. That was pretty Yeah, cool. it's just like the most. The biggest sticking point was the closing date being so far out, and most people weren't a huge fan of it. Yeah, the closing date was in July 31st. That's not that far out. It's not not far. I find that pretty far. Like, it's not ideal for student rental. April, May, June, July. Okay, four. Yeah, for student rental, keep that in mind as well. And it needs a decent amount of work. Oh, it needs a lot of work. Yeah, it's like, uh, it's when I say cosmetic, it's like, it's not like lipstick cosmetic. It's like a tenant like live there and then they mess the place up. That sort of cosmetic. So, yeah. So it's just not like paint. Yeah, that's gonna be tough because someone's gonna close it in August and basically August first and try and do the renovation. That's gonna slip probably into like October, November. Right. You get someone in January, but interesting, interesting. Right. Yeah. What was the uh, what was the story behind it? Like, the seller had had students in there, or it was no. Rich? So the seller oh. sold us on the MLS in 2022, and the deal fell apart because the tenants were there. They inherited the tenants for seven years, underpaying. The tenants stopped paying rent, and then the landlord went in a year and a half LTB hearing case back and forth with the tenant. Eventually, got the eviction notice. Uh, but then the LTB felt bad because if they evicted them, they had nowhere to go. So they extended the sheriff eviction date. So it's official eviction. The sheriff date is all scheduled, but the sheriff date is in July. So they're getting a huge sort of uh, leeway before they move out. So you're not concerned there's any way that they could potentially fight the, like, uh, that I thought it's always the people opening, like, somehow challenging it right before the sheriff shows up, right? And now to be put the stop put on the sheriff order and stuff like that right is that it? yeah i mean it could it could happen but like i can't like you can't expect you know i mean uh, how could i how could i underwrite for that like it is what it is right like i'm taking the face value of everything that's given to me and also i mean the ltv did reward the landlord with the win yeah uh, and it was a year and a half bro like they went to they went to court several times so it's not like it was just one time this is what they settled upon yeah so i don't know man it could it could I don't know. Maybe it will happen, but ho- I'm hoping not because I'm trying to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting, yeah. though. It seems like the market and the wholesale is not bad. Then, uh, it depends. Like it depends on what sort of deal. To be honest with you, I mean, like that was definitely exception. We had walkthroughs for the Mississauga property, and that one is a little bit slower. So we're gonna probably need to renegotiate with the seller. That's a big price, though, right? Like that's a big expensive purchase, I guess. So, is there, do you think it's the smaller prices that are not moving? Like, I think you're. No, I mean, I think GTA still moves pretty well. Like, the big thing with GTA is, is that like with this Mississauga property, it was weird to begin with because some of the October comps were pretty low, and then when you look at the past twenty twenty four comps, they were outrageous. But the October comps were more comparable to the property, like more similar style property. So you can make less. You have to make less adjustments. But that being said, there are like six or seven properties that sold this year, like close by and all of that, that are selling at ridiculous valuations again, because the market sort of pumped up and there's FOMO. So, I mean, as an investor, and I understand as an investor, I'd probably lean towards pushing that. But yeah. realistically speaking, if you're to market this on the MLS, there's a higher chance it'd be compared to the more recent sales data. Right. So it's a toss up. So I don't blame the investors on that. So we're just going to have to go back and renegotiate. Interesting. Yeah. What have, what have you been up to, though, man? Uh, I don't even know, man. Same shit, different day. I'd say February, man. It's crazy. Like when it, when it, whenever I go on a vacation, I feel like my month is just like a write off mass. Right. So like uh, February okay. was weak, bro. Like weak. And then, uh, oh, actually, I'm, I'm literally sitting. I get a notification from Airbnb support tenants complaining. I, I got a fucking a three star review, okay, and I got a four star review, and then I had a 
uh, tenant asked for a refund that basically equated to everything that we made on her stay. Right. So I said no to the refund. I'm like, this is some bullshit. Like, I, I think I gave her like a hundred bucks or something. Yeah. Um, and I got the three star review removed by Airbnb support. Um, because she complained that we didn't have like a hair dryer and there was something else that complained. I can't remember what it was. And but, you like, my didn't mention that in your, in your listing. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So I was like, bro, like what? I, I told the Airbnb, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with her, but like, what do you, what do you already do here? Right. right? <laughs> like we do not have an Airbnb. Uh, we do not have a hair dryer. And then the four star review guy was like, there's no mat by the front door. Oh my God. What? He's like, it's funny outside. I'm like, what do you all need to do yeah. with the mud? We live in a, the Airbnb is in a fucking forest, bro. Yeah. And so that was fucking great. But I, I, I just left that one. I haven't responded to it or anything. And I should, probably should. And Are now you getting annoyed guy, with this management of the Airbnb right now? 100%. I'm talking to, I, I, I talked to, uh, I talked to someone a week or two ago. Uh, we're probably gonna outsource the management. Right? It's it's not it's not my thing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have the patience for yeah, this. Yeah, one shit. like, and I think you understand to optimize it. It takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of research. It's like you're gonna have to spend yeah. a day of your time, an entire day of your time, understanding all of these things, and then yeah. you're gonna have to implement, and that takes a while too. And I also think there's lost revenue here, right? Like at some point, someone broke a headboard table, uh, a headboard on a bed, right? We never traced that back because we also. As part of our process, do not look at every video, and I definitely do not review the video in detail, right? Um, yeah. We, we've lost money on tenants leaving garbage on the side of the house that maybe we didn't notice right away, right? Right, right. Um, we've lost money on by not being on multiple platforms because I can barely manage Airbnb, let alone cottages in Ontario and VRBO or any of that other stuff, right? Yeah. So there's a potential to basically make up whatever we pay in management, increasing revenue. Like I think right now, if we annualize our revenue, We'd be sitting at about 50k. This should easily be a 70k cottage, in in, in my opinion, and in conversations I've had others. Uh, and if we really optimize, and maybe take it to like 80 to 90, right? Um, so even so, paying the fees you know, is worth it. You're right. Like exactly. <laughs> I exactly. mean, you're gonna you're gonna make out ahead, and you're gonna free up your time yeah. completely. Yeah, that makes sense. But if you see our cottage break even is at 50k, and our mortgage is only roughly 50 percent. Right. So like, Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Mortgage is like 25 to 30 K a year. Um, cause we have yeah. like a 500 K mortgage or something like that on it. Um, right. Right. Internet. That's like almost 200 bucks a month. Snow plowing would be like six, five to six hundred dollars a month. Garbage removal, maintenance, farming, electrical, landscaping in the summer, buying random shit for the cottage. Right? Like we calculated out a like, break even that was almost 50 K, but part of that is in, I'm calculating certain like capex part of repairs. Right. But. We'll kind of see what happens. In Are the you guys future. on a static variable by any chance? Are you fixed? Now nah, we're we're in a fucking fix, bro. We 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 bought uh, this thing in 20, 2022 yeah. at the end of twenty twenty two. We bought it, right? So good, good. That good. was when, uh, yeah, we're the we're the we're the buy. Yeah, because I was gonna say it's only half. I was like, dude, this sounds like it's like two k a month, probably. I was like, this sounds like a fixed mortgage <laughs> for sure. Um, I guess last thing here, like I shared this uh, on my LinkedIn, but um rents no surprise they're they're up right so rentals.ca like publishes this like monthly report on where they see rental prices renting asking prices okay so that's a big differentiator it's not what it's actually rented for it's the asking price in a lot of cases especially in toronto i mean it probably goes above the ask price um but it's it's up 10.5 percent year over year which is canada wide canada wide which is pretty ridiculous alberta is up 20 percent Dude, 20% year over year. And since the first rate hike, it's up 21%. I don't think this is, you know, when we talk about inflation data and then how rents are a big part of it. I mean, like, clear to see that. Like, nothing is really slowing down. It's interesting. I'm looking at your post right now, but like today morning, we had a meeting at like 9 a.m. with a couple of like other investors. And the consensus was people are taking like rent cuts. Like, they're they're dropping a rental rate in certain markets, right? Like, Right. Think about the Niagara St. Catherine's well in an area that was like heavily like investor oriented and stuff like that, right? Um, that's always had like a lot of um, like a, like a stagnant kind of like rental demand, right? I think with the market turning, like it took a, a pretty nasty eating in like well in because it was predominantly investors coming in and doing right. uh, triplex conversions, right? Um, so, so that market though, as a result of having a lot of like investors and rental grade stuff, I think takes a good beating. Uh, where yeah. the market is down. So a couple of investors in that area that basically told me they took like 100, 200k cuts on their rental rates to get a good tenant there, right? 
I, I think it's two part actually is, is that's one of them to get the good tenant. The second part is that after a turnover, your rental unit, no matter what type of touch up you do is never going to look as nice yeah. as when you first finished it. And even for me in Sudbury, same situation after a turnover, my rents drop 150 to 200 bucks. Cause I do yeah, touch ups really? and stuff Well, I'm doing. Well, one of them was uh furnish. So keep that in mind. So the furniture is also depreciated now, right? Yeah. They don't even want all of the furniture in there. And also, I've done touch-ups to the unit, but it looks nowhere near as nice when I first put it all together. Uh, maybe 200 is an exaggeration. It's about 150. It was originally uh, 1,800, and, and it's dropped down since. Um, but, I mean, that's the reality. How, how long did that first set and stay there? I think two years. Okay. Yeah, they were there for quite a while. Yeah, so and there were good tenants as well. Um, but I mean, that's the reality of it. If your if your rents are let's say not increasing in the market after a turnover, you might have to bite the bullet and take something slightly lower if it means getting a good tenant, or if it means that your unit's just not comparable to the fresh inventory on the market. Um, but just last point here before we sort of jump into the podcast episode, it's also mentioned, uh, and it's a good thing you brought it up that asking rents in Ontario have only increased by, I think it was like 1%, whereas the majority was driven by the more affordable market. So this is sort of aligns with what we've been chatting about just now, that we're not really seeing the rent growth in major Ontario cities. In fact, Toronto dropped it, because of all of the inventory that's being added on, on the pre-con side. But yeah, I mean, it's just always interesting to see where things are going to go. I mean, it looks like, shit, maybe we should buck and invest in Saskatchewan or something, dude. <laughs> I don't know. We've talked about it before. Uh, I, I saw, I, well, okay, we're not going to go into a whole lot of tangent that, but um, I, I saw something that we, we bought, not really well, they bought, I think it was like a 28 unit or something like that in Saskatchewan, right? Um, it's, it's a good, it's a decent market, but the landlord rules aren't, aren't as favorable as Alberta or, or New Brunswick, which is, I think, the main reason people go out of province, right? But anyway, all right, jumping into today's episode, today we are sharing the uh, live that Austin did with Kellen. Um, I'm sure you guys talked about quite a bit of, uh, good content. We removed a lot of the Q and A from the from the recording. Um, why don't you ever have a quick synopsis of what you guys covered, Austin? Yeah, this this is this is an introduction from someone who hasn't heard the episode. You didn't tune into the Q and A, am I? You bastard! <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I know. You know what? Like, I'm not even hating because, like, sometimes when someone shares your podcast when you're on, I don't listen to that too. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> it's, 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 it's mutual. We both talk to each other all the time. Yeah. But in today, yeah, to, like as Mayu was mentioning, it's just a live stream Q&A on multifamily properties. Uh, Kellen has a pretty fantastic presentation at the beginning where he talks about really how he gets started on his journey, how he was able to scale, how he worked his way up into multifamilies and then developments, how he's structuring deals, a little bit on the financing aspect and what the next steps are. And he gives pretty practical steps on strategic renovations for these multifamilies too. Um, there's some Q&A if you guys want to listen to the full recording. I think it, it should be on the Rise Network Facebook page for you to check out. Definitely on the YouTube page. So without further ado, we'll jump right on in. Just a heads up before we get started. This podcast is all about providing you information, not financial or legal advice. So if you need the real deal for your situation, hit up a professional. We can't promise you our information is always up to date or accurate, and we're not responsible for any investment decisions you make based on it. Markets change, information change, you know the drill. Anyways, thank you for hanging out with us responsibly. Let's jump right on in. Today we have Kellen Jeans. He's a multifamily expert with 88 units, over $15 million assets under management, and has not used any joint venture partnerships whatsoever. So he ended up scaling his portfolio with his own money. Myself, my name is Austin. I'm going to be the host for tonight. So we're going to jump off into a presentation with Kellen. He's going to go over his journey. He's going to go over some good tips about multifamily property. And if you guys have any questions, make sure to drop it down in the chat. We'll make sure to monitor it throughout the night. And we're going to switch over to the presentation view. Perfect. And we are uh, we are good to go. So Kellen, going to pass over the mic to you. Awesome. Sounds good. Appreciate it, Austin. And thank you guys for your patience on that. So I'm going to do try to keep it relatively short because I generally the way thing, these things go, there's lots of questions at the end. So I'm going to try to fly through the presentation and then we'll jump into Q&A. But just a quick presentation on scaling a multifamily portfolio. Um, you know, my goal is always to provide real strategic tactical information and using some real actual case studies. 
And so uh, let's dive into it if I can get to the next slide. So uh, my name is Kellen James. If you guys don't know who I am, I'm a long-term multifamily investor here in, I'm in Ontario, Canada. I have a $15 million portfolio of 88 units and I have no partners at all. It's just myself, solely owned. And um, I actually quit my job uh, back when I was 29. I'm 34 now. And uh, I uh, basically shortly after quitting my job, I had 32 units at the time. And we left shortly after my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, and we left on a van trip. And we lived in our Dodge Sprinter van for three months together and traveled around the US and uh, kind of got back to Canada and went, okay, well, it's it's Monday and I don't have a job now and what's the plan? So um, I decided to continue scaling my real estate portfolio because I, I really enjoyed what I was doing when it came to that. And um, so I just continued scaling it from there. And then at some point along the lines, I started you know, coaching and mentoring other people to do the same kind of thing and build their portfolios of their own. And it's actually pretty neat because I've seen a bunch of my uh, current and previous students now since quit their jobs and stuff and build portfolios of their own. Um, which has been really neat to see. So that's a bit about myself. And I document most of my journey on uh, Instagram. This is my journey from, from zero to 88 units. And it was a seven year journey in order to get there. So property number one, I bought in 2016. And uh, at the time I was renting, uh, if anyone's from London, I was on, living on Talbot Street in London and I just worked um, in the tech world. So I was walking to work every day. I sold my car when I moved to London and I just walked to work every day and saved every penny I could. And, um, by after, I think it was about, yeah, it was so 2012, I graduated. So four years or so later, I'd saved up 120 grand just by working. I made like 50 grand in my day job. And towards the end, I made, I made 80,000 at, at the most in my day job before I eventually left. And, um, I was just saving at 120 grand saved up and I decided to get my first duplex. I did that with 5% down, luckily, um, you know, because I had a mentor at the time, Matt McKeever, a lot of you probably know. And uh, he he really urged me to continue up with acquisition momentum, which was drilled into my brain. And I continue to drill it into other people's because if you just spend all your money, you can't buy any more real estate. So it's always about getting your money back out of deals in order to continue scaling your portfolio from there. And that's what burring is all about. And I think a lot of people forget that part of the process, getting your money back out so you can keep up momentum. So that first property was 2016 and um, 5% down. I lived in one half, rented the other, and then moved on to property number two very shortly after another duplex. And I got a really great deal on it. It ended up being my first perfect burr. I got all my money out and I got more out. And so that allowed me to really continue scaling from there because that first one was only 5% down. And the next one, I got all my money and more. So I really had enough momentum to, to buy properties three and four. And I continued to do that same type of strategy I applied things like the Purchase Plus Improvements Mortgage, which I'll dive into a bit here. Um, all sorts of different strategies in order to get my money back out of every deal. And I just, cont- just once I found a strategy that worked, I just rinse and repeat it. And I think that's really the key to success in any field is just find something that you know how to do, learn how to scale it. And then, so that's what I kept doing. And, you know, a lot of people were getting into all sorts of other things. And I was like, the burring's working. I'm just going to keep doing this. And, you know, by uh, 20. 19, I quit my job at 32 units at the time. And then I continued to scale from there. And I self managed until I had 52 units. And then I brought on management. And at this point, I have 88 units. Um, and this is sort of the breakdown of my portfolio here. And, and you can see it takes time, you know, you don't buy all this stuff at once, you get a cup one, two, you know, one or two properties a year kind of thing, and it can continue to scale from there. So uh, you can see at some point along the lines, I switched into larger multifamily as well. So you can see say around 2020 actually is when I started getting the six units, eight units, a 24 unit, that sort of stuff. And that's, that is tough to do with, uh, with no partners, but I'll get more into that. And so opportunity overload is what everyone tends to deal with in this, uh, real estate space. This is just in the real estate space. There's burring, flipping, long-term buy and hold, single family, multifamily, commercial. You can get, even in the commercial space, there's apartments, there's mixed use, there's conversions, adding units, short-term rentals, Airbnb, wholesaling. The list is ridiculous. There's so much you can do. And, you know, especially on social media, you tend to see quite a lot of people doing all sorts of different things. And it tends to be quite a distraction, honestly. Um, and, you know, I dove into all of these things. I didn't do them, but I dove into them to see if they were going to be a good fit for me. And really, you know, it was all about maintaining focus. Um, 
I decided none of that was for me. I'm going to focus on one of these things, which is just long-term buy and hold with multifamily apartments. And that was my niche, which I actually never really thought of as a niche at all. I thought that was sort of, that makes sense, right? You're going to scale up a portfolio. Well, why not buy properties yourself and do it with you know multifamily buildings? And it turned out uh, to be quite a niche these days. There's a lot of people doing all sorts of other things, but I really have a lot of belief in this strategy over the long term. And so it's always important to start with your why if you're reverse engineering your goals. So if you don't have a good reason to do something, then there's no reason to try to figure out why, or sorry, how to do that thing if you don't know why you're doing it. Um, and so, you know, if you're trying to adopt a certain diet or something like that, what's the point in trying to figure out how to do that? You first have to figure out this is even for you. Um, and so it's really important to figure out why real estate investing is something that fits into your lifestyle and into your goals. And that once you understand that why, you're a lot clearer on why you want to then figure out how to do it from there. And so say your goal is $4,000 a month of passive income, you know, or more, what does that look like? So for example, maybe that's $200 a unit for of cash flow. Maybe you need a 20 unit portfolio, or maybe you're looking at portfolio like these days where it's zero cash flow with interest rates where they're at, you tend to be, tends to be quite difficult to get properties with significant cash flow at current rates and that's okay. So maybe in that scenario, you're focused a little bit more on uh, assets under management. So you're trying to really build a large portfolio with significant mortgage pay down, long-term appreciation and forced appreciation, which is the most important thing. Um, and then to decide whether you're going to have actively managed or you're going to bring on property management to do it for you. And so forced appreciation versus market appreciation this is something people don't make enough of a distinction about. And it's really all about forced appreciation because this is the only thing we have control over. And not just in the real estate space, but in the real estate space, we need to focus on what we have control over. There's no point in spending time thinking about the things we can't control. And that's uh, one of the basis of stoicism, if you guys are into that stuff, and Ryan Holiday's books. Uh, but it definitely applies to real estate. Um, Short-term market appreciation, if you're looking at one to three years, we have no idea if mar market's going to go up, market's going to go down. You know, in the market that we've seen recently, that's definitely the case. We, we, we haven't seen it going up this last while a lot, at least in Ontario. Um, been a bit of a different case out west um but we are looking to figure out how we can force appreciation so that's something that's predictable we have control over it and we know that maybe short-term market appreciation happens anyway but we do have a lot of confidence that long-term market appreci appreciation is basically inevitable um, and that's largely going to be driven by inflation um you know governments printing more money and assets going up in value dollar value going down this is the reason why we don't want to just have cash sitting in the bank and Real estate is one of those things that over the long term, I don't think very many people doubt, you know, if you own a building now, what it's going to be worth 20 years from now is probably going to be quite a bit more. And uh, it's going to go up in value faster than your your cash sitting in the bank will. And especially when it's leveraged five times like you would if you had 20% down payment on a property. And so there are joint venture partnerships. You know, some people go about that. I've still done not done a single joint venture partnership in any of my deals. Um, but it is definitely a strategy people can take on if they'd like, uh, the advantage of it is that you have unlimited money. And the main, main reason why is you're using none of your own money. Um, the passive partner allows easy financing with a lenders, um, and like Scotia bank, TD, whatever it might be. And then the active partner has no need to qualify with T4 income or require one month of self-employment history or anything like that. And so there are a lot of advantages to that type of structure. Um, that being said, over the last seven years that I've been investing, very few people have really hung on to any of these joint venture partner, partner uh, deals. They really tend to not hang on to them very long. They tend to sell them off or break up the partnership somewhere along the lines. And that was always a bit of a concern of mine over the years. And it's definitely turned out to be the case for quite a few people. Um, there's a lot of people I know that scaled portfolios with joint venture partners. And at some point they decided to sell off a lot of the partner deals and move on to uh, solely on things. So um why not just start solely owned and learn how the financing game works and learn how to keep up acquisition of your own money. So the cons to active passive JV partnerships, you know, 50% of the equity, 50% of the cash flow. You have a new manage or new relationship to manage. You have less control over the deal, uh, depending on the terms of your joint venture partnership structure. Um, holding, selling, refinancing, renovating, all these things you need to run by your partner. Um, you know, an ideal partner is going to be someone that just hundred percent trusts you. And it's definitely possible to find people like that. Um, but you need to know that people are completely trust trusting of all of your decisions 
and they're just happy to sit back and you do all of the work and make all of the money. And um, at the end of the day, you guys split it. But you do have to bear in mind that you're doing twice the amount of work for the same result or you're doing the same amount of work for half the result. And so I really like the idea of doing fewer deals, but doing them all on your own. Um, so that's the way that I've scaled my portfolio slow and steady, although um, it can be done quickly. Uh, I mean, I got my first 32 units in two and a half years, and that was largely in part to forcing appreciation. And of course, we did have quite a bit of market appreciation, which it was completely out of my control, but it was it was never part of the uh, plan. Um, and then significant cash flow also helps. And this is also something that people really saw the value of when interest rates dropped, because if you didn't have significant cash flow, um, it was really hard to ride through some of these times this last while. And there've been very, there've been quite a few investors that haven't been able to ride through these times. Um, and so it's really about forcing appreciation and it's about making sure your properties are, you know, in this market with rates where they're at, I think a property that's cash flow neutral and, or cash flowing a little bit is perfectly reasonable. Um, but I definitely think doing it on your own, if you have the option, is the way to uh, is the way to go, at least for me. So there are many other ways to use other people's money. There's promissory notes, you know, borrowing from friends, family, other investors. Uh, there's unsecured lines of credit, and I should bring it back to the prom notes. This has been a topic of large controversy, and for good reason. This is something where if you're a lender, generally, I wouldn't recommend loaning out on a promissory note. Uh, you have to you know, really trust the person you're lending to because you don't really have a lot to hold to fall back on if they decide not to pay you back. Um, now, if you're the borrower, perfectly fine to borrow on a promissory note because it's quite safe from your position. But there's a lot of people who take quite a bit of advantage of that and have racked up millions and millions or tens of millions of dollars in promissory note debt. And people don't make enough of a plan as to how they're going to pay that back. So it's very important when you're raising other people's money to have a very clear plan as to how you're planning on paying it back. Um, and so unsecured lines of credit are another way to do that. I definitely recommend people, this is, if there's one takeaway from this event, uh, like one quick go-to for everyone, get a bunch of unsecured lines of credit. I have them at TD, Scotiabank, RBC, Tangerine. I have them on my corporations as well. You can get uh, business lines of credit. I have one for each of my corporations. These are things you don't have to use. Uh, and in fact, I'd recommend not using them unless you need them. Uh, treat them as an emergency fund, but get as many of them as possible. Your credit score will drop slightly during the initial applications, but you'll be able to, uh, your, your score will recover within a few months and you'll now have access to that debt. And you're actually, you'll have, you'll have more available debt, available credit, meaning your debt utilization will be lower. And so that's valuable when it comes to maintaining a, a healthy credit score and also just having available cash if you do need it. Um, there's also secured loans. You can get first, second position loans. You can borrow from people you know by just finding private lenders on your own, or you can work through a mortgage broker and oftentimes pay a 1% or more broker fee. You can also do RSP and TFSA loans. So you can borrow from other, you know, people you know from their RSPs and TFSAs. You can do that through a company called Olympia Trust um, and other trust companies. Um, you can do vendor take back mortgages where you borrow from the person that you're buying the house off of. And then you can do, uh, of course, banks, where we're doing most of my, you know, most of my debt is just from banks and credit unions, uh, and mo mostly credit unions these days. Once you don't have T4 income or self-employment income or anything like that anymore, and you're qualifying based on the portfolio itself, credit unions are a really good way to go. And so a novel idea is maybe consider using your own money. And a lot of people don't have lots of that. And that's completely, that's generally where people just say, well, I'm going to start borrowing other people's money. But if you can be frugal and save up enough for that first deal and make sure that first deal is value add and has the opportunity to burr and get your money back out of it, you can keep up acquisition momentum without having to borrow large amounts of other people's money or bring on partners. And, you know, we've seen the struggle of people taking on too many partners and we've now seen a lot of the struggle of people taking on too much private debt. And so, um, you know, maybe just take a take a take a breath don't scale the portfolio too quickly and just continue scaling at a reasonable pace over a, over some years and get your own money back out of your own deals um so if you're successfully burying properties you're you're successfully recycling the same down payment funds over and over again i started with 120 grand that same 120 grand is what has built my portfolio up to 15 million dollars uh, 80 units and i did that just with bank funds and then i did bring on a bunch of promissory notes 
over time, but I turned turned out to be quite a stressor for me, honestly, to have too much promissory note debt because I always need to have a plan for how I'm going to pay it back. And um, when the market was going down and interest rates were going up, that became quite a struggle. So I actually ended up selling off two of my two of my buildings. So not a lot, but enough for me to pull out a bunch of cash, pay off prom notes, and just really try to be done with doing too much of that. Um, and uh, yeah, but the goal is recycle your same money over and over. So that 120 grand I started with is what built the portfolio I have today using mostly banks and credit unions and some private debt for a bridge loan to bridge the gap between, you know, taking on the initial deal and then eventually refinancing it with a traditional lender. So my first property was uh, 5% down on my duplex. That's me standing in front of my first property in 2016. If you scroll all the way to the bottom of my Instagram account, that's the first photo I posted because I wasn't really on social media before that, but I was like, well, I'm going to share my real estate journey. And, um, you know, I just spent years just documenting my journey. Um, I wasn't doing any coaching or anything like that. I just really wanted to share kind of what I've been, what I've been up to. And, uh, you know, it allowed me to, you know, I definitely recommend everyone do this because you can really build a lot of connections with people. Um, there's a ton of value in that. So you learn how to be a landlord, you learn how renovations work and you can live for free. And then start to burr. I'm going to have to fly through these slides to get through this in a good amount of time, but just start to burr. Buy under rented, undervalued assets, do strategic renovations, refinance up to 75 or 80% loan to value, depending on the lender you're working with and your financial situation, and then repeat using those same funds uh, to refinance in the, into the next deal. So this is a really basic uh, example of a burr project. So let's say you can buy a property for $400,000. And of course, these numbers are going to be different in every city. But you can definitely find deals that work sort of like this. You know, $400,000, you're, you're, you're putting $80,000 of renovations in. And let's say in that scenario, it's worth $600,000 when you're done. You know, this might be a triplex in like a really, you know, in a not too expensive market or maybe a duplex. Um, but, you know, you're, you're in for four eighty, dollars and it's worth six hundred. dollars um, But the way the numbers shake out, if you put it into the Burr calculator, is that that very bottom right number, $6,000. You know, if you are 80% loan to value when you buy the property and 80% loan to value when you refinance it, then that's how the numbers shake out. You end up only being $6,000 out of pocket and you're ready to take all of your money and reapply it to the next deal. So these are the types of deals you want to be looking for in a perfect scenario. Of course, oftentimes your out of pocket amount is going to be quite a bit higher, uh, but this is the gold standard. This is the kind of thing you're looking for. After your first property, I generally recommend people do that first property using actually the bottom strategy here, which is 5% down and using a purchase plus improvements mortgage. And so 5% um, down, so your down payment is very low. Purchase plus improvements mortgage allows you to get your refinance money back out. And you can make some very specific decisions about what kind of renovations you're going to do in that scenario. You're ideally going to keep your renovations very minimal and get that renovation money back out. Um, now, if you're doing 5% down without a purchase plus improvements mortgage, you're going to definitely want to keep your renovation uh, budget quite low uh, because you're not going to refinance that money back out. You're already at 95% loan to value. And so you're pretty max already. You're well leveraged. So you generally just want to keep those old windows, you know, hang on to the building the way it is, do some painting and clean up and get the thing rented. But then at the top of the list is your bread and butter deal, 20% down burr using a cash out refinance. The goal there is to focus on a balance of maximizing your after repair value and your rents. And those are the things that allow you to pull as much money out of that deal as possible. And so the go-tos for renovations, it's a little bit blocked on my screen, but I'll do my best. So there's uh, painting, of course, use the same paint in all your units, uh, discount from the paint supplier. Uh, so you can get like a Dulux account and you'll often get like 50% off your paint. Uh, flooring, vinyl plank throughout. I generally use glue down vinyl plank instead of click lock vinyl plank. It's a lot easier to replace just one piece of flooring when you do it with glue down, but they both can be useful. Um, kitchens and bathrooms, uh, every, you can use vinyl plank throughout the whole unit. So bathrooms, you can you can re-enamel the tub and or the tile. You can actually get someone to come out and like spray it with a new white enamel coating. You can actually get an enamel pen for like 10 bucks at Home Depot and you can touch up bathtubs, you know, if the spots they were chipped and things like that. You can put in a permanent bath mat, which are... Um, a bath mat that actually gets glued down to the bottom of the tub and it prevents the new enamel from getting uh, uh, rubbed away because the it's not quite as durable as the original enamel, but that's a good go-to for re-enameling a tub and tile without having to rip the whole bathroom apart. Um, laundry, I generally like to do shared coin-op when you can, even in a triplex or a fourplex. 
Um, if it's a duplex, maybe in suite laundry is probably a good way to go. Um, but uh, I really prefer shared coin op because people are a lot more cognizant of their use of the utilities in that scenario. Um, unless you have separate water and and uh, hydro, then in suite laundry is perfectly fine. Um, but you know, at scale, I really prefer having a coin op laundry room, just in my experience, and and I'm not alone in that. Um, Adding bathrooms and bedrooms when you have the opportunity to. So converting maybe a bachelor unit into a one bedroom unit or splitting a two bed unit into multiple units or a three bed unit into multiple units. Um, generally trying to eliminate a dining room, maybe add a bedroom or a bathroom where that space was. So you can have an open concept kitchen and living room. Um, you can combine the kitchen and living room into one room and then that way you can now add a bedroom where the dining room might have been. And then take advantage of energy rebates like uh, Enbridge and things like that, where you can get money back for insulating your properties and uh, all sorts of other efficiencies that you can do. So just an example of painting cabinets, but we can skip to the next one. That's just a really quick way to put some uh, put some paint on the cabinets and transform a kitchen. Uh, here's an example of where I added a bathroom. Uh, there was just a useless space and we put a kind of a crappy bathroom in. Honestly, I'd probably do it different. This was years ago, but it's a new bathroom where there was no bathroom and that definitely adds value to the property, both for the tenants and for the appraiser. Some landscaping in this scenario, just keep it clean and simple. I took all everything out and I just put grass. So we did new sod and uh, a new fence in this scenario. And it just made for a nice fence in backyard. Um, just keep it simple. Here's an example of changing a layout to make the better use of the space in a bathroom. So you can see the shower stall on the top left. And then we demoed it and put in a new shower that took up the whole wall. So that you know made much better use of the space there. And then energy rebates. Here's an example of insulating the attic in one of my triplexes. I used to live in this property, actually. And uh, we insulated the attic. And this is one winter versus the next winter. Um, uh, when you insulate the attic, you're less likely to have ice melting on the roof or snow melting on the roof and then refreezing into ice and causing damage. So vent, uh, uh, insulate your attics and then also vent them. So you just want to make sure that's done properly. Here's an example of reglazing a shower and... Uh, bathtub. Uh, I think we might have done the tile and the tub in this scenario, and there's a permanent bath mat example on the bottom of the tub there. So that was, you know, maybe under a thousand bucks versus tearing the tub out and starting all over. Here's an eight plex deal that I did quite recently. Um, so I got a really, really great purchase price on this. Um, I paid, uh, it, it was listed for 750,000. I paid 600,000. It was on the MLS, it sat there. Um, this was, uh, maybe a year and a half ago or something now, maybe something like that, maybe, maybe coming up on two years ago now, but if either way, 700 600,000 for an eight plex, um, it sat on the MLS and there was a bit of a flood of listings at that time. And so I think people got lost and didn't really see the potential in this deal somehow. Um, but I mean, uh, this sat there for two months before I put this offer in for 150 grand under asking. And, um, we ended up, I ended up putting, um, I think, yeah, renovations, 350 grand, uh, and then 50 grand of cash for keys. So I was in for, um, I was in for a million dollars and it reappraised at 1.75. So that was an equity gain of $750,000. Um, that was definitely one of my best deals. Um, it was a big version of what I was doing with, you know, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, but it's the same thing. And, um, and I, and uh, we'll jump to the next slide and I'll show you how the financing actually, I think I, I left that out. I don't know if I left it out. We'll see. So the um, backyard in this scenario, this eight plex, if you look on the right hand photo, um, on the bottom right of that photo is the eight plex. The rest of this lot is just this giant empty space. And someone actually asked a question about this uh, on the Facebook group. So I'll get into that. But basically, there's a bunch of land around this eight plex that has the potential for development. And I've never done a development. I've never built a building from scratch before. Um, generally found a lot of value in just buying existing buildings and renovating them. But in this scenario, I already own the land and I already own the eight plex and we've turned all eight units over and it's cash flowing. And so let's uh, look at building a building behind it. So I, I uh, worked with a uh, local company that helps with uh, urban planning. So they actually communicate with the city because I don't feel like learning all the ins and outs of how to do all that paperwork. So I hired a company that helps with it and we're putting in an application right now to build a 12 plex in behind my eight plex. So in this scenario, we'd have 20 units on this land. Uh, we'd have very little parking, <laughs> but uh, surprisingly, the city of London is open to this concept. 
of only 0.5 parking spaces per unit. I think that they know that we need housing more than we need parking. And so um, they're open to the idea uh, based on a pre-application consultation we'd done. And uh, so fingers crossed we get approval for this 12 plex. We're right now trying to push for as many two bedroom units in this as possible. And uh, so small versus large apartment buildings is a quite a common conversation. You saw that I made that transition in 2020 into sm into larger. And so I've experienced with both and I do, I don't think one is better than the other. Um, so small two to four unit duplex, triplex, fourplex, they move a lot quicker. Their financing is easier. So you're going to get more like 80% loan to value upwards of you're going to get 30 year amortization. You can get lower interest rates because they're residential. They're more liquid if you do decide to sell these buildings. So there's a lot of advantages to this. And they're also just quite a bit more approachable, um, a little bit less scary to take on. So I generally recommend people start there. I don't think people should jump into large apartment buildings, even if they have a bunch of cash. Start with some, start with some smaller ones, get a feel for it. Um, and then the large apartment buildings, six units and up, they're crazy capital intensive. So for example, a $2.4 million 12-plex, that would be six hundred dollars to $720,000 for the down payment. And so... Very capital intensive, especially if you're doing it without partners. And so um, that's one of the big downsides of it. Um, now you have to get very creative in order to have less down. So you can do second position vendor take backs and all these interesting strategies. You can do CMHC mortgages to get higher loan to value. But generally, you still need to close in initially without those types of, without a CMHC mortgage. So you, you know, private financing or all these other types of strategies. But um they they tend to move quite a bit slower, but they do scale well once you've already built your foundation. And so what I've what I have found is that they're a lot lower men mental bandwidth. So you know, owning uh, my twenty four unit building is a lot less mental bandwidth than owning twelve duplexes. Um, and so I really value that, and I also value that the the, um, the value of the building is more predictable based on cap rates and net operating income. Whereas when you're dealing with two to four unit buildings. The value is based a little bit more on comparable sales, which can be a little bit more all over the place. And so I like the larger buildings for that reason. So this is the long-term ultimate wealth builder. Uh, so it's just about building up your assets under management. Let's say you buy one triplex per year. They're 550 to 650 grand each. After five years, you'd have five triplexes, 15 units, no partners. You'd have a portfolio worth 2.75 to 3.25. Even if you have zero cash flow, you're going to have mortgage pay down. Let's make a guess. And this is a complete shot in the dark based on maybe just my experience with my portfolio around $220 per unit per month of mortgage pay down. So the principal portion of your mortgage payment. So that adds up to $3,300 a month in mortgage pay down. You're going to have maybe portfolio appreciation over the long term. If we're looking at a 10, 20 year period, say 3% per year that uh, on your portfolio value of 3.25, that would average out to be $8,125 a month in long-term appreciation that you'd be earning. Um, and then that totals up to $11,425 per month and it continues to compound over time. And so this is the value of building up a lot of assets under management. So some of the stuff I'm currently doing right now, the possible 12 flex development, fingers crossed, we get approval. Um, we're doing a major, I'm doing, a, and when I say we, it's myself, my property managers and my construction team. We're doing a major renovation on um, one of my eight plexes. We're waiting on permits right now. It's going to be $400,000 or more for that renovation. And that's a complete shot in the dark as to what that cost will be. Honestly, I haven't run the numbers yet. Um, we're going to, we're doing a bunch of ongoing renovations from recent turnovers. We have had some natural turnovers where people just leave on their own. And we've had a bunch of cash keys where I pay tenants to move. And we've uh, we're going to be approaching a bunch more tenants with cash for keys in the spring because people are a lot more likely to move in the spring than if you approach them in the winter to move. Uh, I've found a lot less success during that season. Um, keeping my social media active. So podcasts, things like this, short form content, et cetera. Uh, it's a bunch of the stuff that's keeping me busy and then created the multifamily mastermind recently as well. And that's been really great. And uh, I'm preparing my 24 unit apartment building for a uh, refinance. So fingers crossed. I'm going to be re refinancing that probably with a credit union for now, but in the long term, I'll probably look at refinancing it with CMHC. Um, and then I'm adding an Airbnb suite to the basement of our house right now. Um, so it's going to work for uh, Airbnb for now. And then in, a long, in you know a year, two or three, whenever we feel like it, we'll take the door off between the units and it'll become the rest of our house. But in the meantime, 
we don't really need that basement for ourselves. So we may as well, we're hoping to get 2,500 bucks to 3,000 a month uh, for that basement and figure why not. It gives us an excuse to do some renovations down there when we probably wouldn't otherwise. All right. I flew through that as quick as I could. Uh, so yeah, my website, kellenjames.ca. Uh, I'm going to have some, I, I'm posting more and more, but right now I have uh, a free real estate calculator for you guys there right now. Uh, it's a profit planner. It's basically how to do bird calculations. This isn't, this is something everyone already knows potentially, but I use this myself all the time. So I think everyone should have a go to Burr calculator. You're analyzing a deal, run the numbers on it. Just make sure that you're understanding how much equity you're building and how much out of pocket you are. And so, um, it's on the bottom, the bar here that uh, Austin put there and the, the bottom bar thing in blue, it's kellenjames.ca slash rise. It's just a free calculator for you guys. Uh, definitely recommend getting a copy of that. And uh, let's jump into the Q&A. Uh, we have quite a bit of engagement, so that's good. Let's get started off. Let me see if I can show the questions. You see that there? Oh, cool. Yeah, fancy. Perfect. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even know you could do that. So where can you find <laughs> properties that would meet the, 50, meet the 50% rental offset rule in today's market? If markets, why don't you explain the 50% offset rule is for people who don't know and then address the question? Yeah, so the the 50% rule is often used by banks like Scotia Bank um in order to make sure that the properties are floating themselves in the eyes of the bank. So they're let's say zero cash flow in their eyes, but they're not costing you uh month to month and so the bank is more likely to continue approving you for mortgages because you're not buying up properties that are losing money in their eyes. And so that's going to be the total gross rents divided by 2. And then you're going to subtract the mortgage payment and the property taxes from that. And uh, historically, they used to subtract the heat or the gas bill from that, but I don't think they have to anymore. Um, and so uh, if that number is zero, then the, pro the property floats itself. Um, if it's positive, it actually improves your qualifying ability. And if it's negative, then it's uh, affecting your qualifying ability negatively. Um, realistically, it's quite difficult to find properties that are meeting this rule. Um, you know, I built a lot of my portfolio on what I call unicorns. They're really hard to find deals uh, that meet these types of rules, but this is the gold standard that we're shooting for. Um, and so uh, where would you find that sort of thing? Probably in smaller markets, you know, maybe in like Chatham, Sarnia. Um, maybe it's possible to find them in London, although I, I do think it's going to be quite difficult. They're going to be in like less expensive markets uh, where your mortgages are less and your income is similar. Maybe Sudbury uh, would be doable. Uh, definitely in places like Edmonton, uh, if you head out west, or maybe if you're in Saskatchewan or Eastern Canada. Um, otherwise, you know, if you have good, if you have solid job income or self-employment income or things like that, you can use that to help in order to continue qualifying. And so if your properties do end up with a negative uh, rental, like a ne negative number after you've done that math, um, you know, you still might be able to continue qualifying anyway, just based on your active income. Mm -hmm. And just to add on to that, uh, it does get tough if you're starting to burr when you refinance on ARV, because obviously prices are a little bit elevated, but we'll jump on to the next question here. Which markets do you think we should be looking at right now? So, um, I, I hesitate to, like, I, I tend to throw a lot of cities out there because I think there's potential and uh, like the way to view this is that there's, you know, you know, every strategy can work and every market can work, but not every strategy can work in every market. Um, and so depending on your strategy, um, you know, if you're looking at burring, I mean, it's really all about forcing appreciation and refinancing. And ideally, those properties also are around cash flow neutral uh, after you've done your refi. And so if you so that tends to be the limiting factor is the is it cash flow neutral after your refi? And so those are the, that's where you t tend to rely on markets that are less expensive. So I think this is like, I, I'm, I do like London. This is where I currently invest. I think St. Thomas is interesting. I think Sudbury is interesting. Um, I think there's a lot of people in Edmonton that are doing a lot of cool stuff. The property values are quite low and the rental income is quite high there. Um, uh, Windsor, you know, definitely still has potential. Um, you know, I wouldn't go to markets that are too, too small. Um, I'm not personally interested in that because I think the long-term future is a little bit more questionable. But if you're in a market that's got a decent population, the population trend is positive and the population's growing. 
but not just growing, growing in a way that's where people will actually stay because you see markets maybe like Regina or something where there's a lot of people moving there, but then there are a lot of people moving out of there too. <laughs> and it's because they realize they don't want to stay because it's cold. Um, and so, you know, markets that you think will sustain, a, uh, you know, a rise in population over the long term, and uh, you know, just looking for places that have, you know, maybe tech tech work or hospital work or you know, some of these things that you think that you know we expect to be around for the long term. Um, you know, you know, I, I look at now. I hesitate to say this because there's probably pe- people in this market, but Sault Ste. Marie. I grew up in Sault Ste. Marie. It's my hometown, and uh, you know, they tend to be very re- heavily reliant on the steel plant there. And so that's a market, an example of a market where let's say that steel plant goes under, that makes, that's a big, big problem for that city if that happens. And so I don't like if we have too many eggs in one basket. So, you know, a decent variety of, uh, of, um, uh, industries in your city would be, uh, helpful. <laughs> awesome. Now, I guess, uh, the first targeted multifamily question of the day, what is the best way to learn how to underwrite multifamily deals? So you definitely like... You like a lot of times people spend quite a bit of time in spreadsheets and, and that's realistically what you have to do. Um, it's also helpful to have people to run it by. So if you can have mentors in your life, fellow investors, people that have experience with this, going through these things and running it by them to see if you're doing it right is a really, really, that's the way to learn anything, right? Is we need feedback to know if we're doing it right. Um, and so, you know, underwriting a deal, spending a lot of time in spreadsheets, looking at, um, you know, trying to figure out its current value and its after repair value. And so current value is a little bit tough because a lot of times we're really trying to analyze its potential. And, you know, if you're looking at properties based on a cap rate on the acquisition, it's not really, I don't know, I haven't found it to be particularly helpful. Um, I mean, if you're looking at a, you know, 12 units and up, it can be useful. Um, But when you're looking at anything under 12 units, um, cap rates, I don't think are particularly reliable for the initial acquisition. I think they're more helpful for the after repair value. Um, and, and a lot of times we're looking at stuff that's maybe, a, maybe it's a crappy, maybe it's a bad cap rate on the acquisition, but it's because you know that you're going to add bedrooms here. You're going to add a unit here. You're going to, you're going to get cash for keys in these units quite quickly or whatever the potential, you know, like you see the plan in place. And so I've bought properties that maybe had bad, you know, definitely lost money month to month on the acquisition, but it was because I had a plan for them, a very clear plan. And so, you know, it's a variety of looking at, you know, looking at its current value. So you're going to look at comparable sales. You're going to look at price per unit potentially, and you're going to look at maybe cap rates as well. And then looking at the after repair value. And that's, you know, based on similar things, but if you're in six units and up, then you're going to more look at price per unit and cap rates. Um, Comparable sales are going to be a little bit tougher on apartment buildings um, because they just tend to be so different depending on their location and things like that. Um, So it's really, Figuring out like the, the the gold standard of all this stuff is looking at your Burr calculation and then also looking at your cash flow calculation. Those are the two main calculations you want to do. How much are you going to be out of pocket on this deal? Uh, so how much are you leaving in the deal and not getting back out? And trying to keep, keep that number as low as possible so you can keep up your acquisition momentum. And then also looking at how much month to month are you going to be maybe burning on the initial acquisition? And then what is a... Um, you know, worst case scenario, a normal case scenario and a best case scenario and kind of running those three scenarios uh, for cash flow um, to see, uh, you know, if you're happy with the normal case scenario or maybe even a little bit of a bad case scenario and the deal still works, then that tends to be uh, sort of the the sweet spot. I mean, ideally, it's going to be a unicorn where you're like, for sure, this is a home run and, you know, definitely try to find those when you can. So I'm going to actually dig down a little bit deeper into this question as well to expand on it. Um, actually, before I do so, to your point uh, on acquisitions of cap rate when you buy the property, like just for example, imagine someone's looking at a property in Toronto that's like a six unit, okay? And the uh, uh, net operating income is about 60000 uh, a year. And let's say it's a four cap that you're willing to pay. No one's going to sell a six plex for $1.5 in Toronto, right? Like that's just what world are you in? So you do it's you do kind of have to pay an upside. But that being said, how do you determine your max allowable offer on on properties? If you're not looking at cap rates on entry, um, how are you determining this is the price that I'm comfortable in offering? When I look back at my acquisitions, there have been very few deals where um, they weren't an obvious yes. And so I don't really have anything that where if I were running the numbers, things are tight. And so I'm looking at 
you know, when I look at my after repair value, I'm really being very conservative about it. Um, and I'm looking at, you know, if, if you're looking at, let's say four plexes, um, I think four plexes are kind of a sweet spot for a lot of people. They're still in the residential space and you can still maybe get them with 20% down and things like that. So you're probably going to be looking more at comparable sales in that scenario. If you look at current values right now for fourplexes, and you can look at some of the maybe lower end of those fourplexes and in uh, for comparable sales, and that number still works on your Burr calculation. Um, and you have some degree of predictability when it comes to getting units turned over and getting the getting the re- rental income up. And your property is say cash flow neutral after the refinance, or even loses hundred bucks a month or something like that. I think having a burn rate is okay when it's reasonable. Um, that's the kind of deal I think that that would be like, you know, a baseline type deal for me. Um, ideally, these properties are, um, you know, a no brainer um, is the goal. Uh, so, you know, as little money out of pocket as possible. You know, this this kind of stuff is, um, you know, when you're looking at 12 units and up or thing or six units and up, even this is often going to be a multi year process. It's, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Um and it's also st- starts to become quite a bit less predictable. So you have to be comfortable to some degree leaving a chunk of money in a deal for quite a while. For example, my 24 unit building, you know, it was over a million dollars for the down payment. And I've put a bunch of money into it since. And uh, as frustrating as it is, I haven't refinanced it yet. And so it's been, I think, two years. Um, you know, we've turned 12 of the 24 units over and we're working on more as we speak. Uh, hopefully get a 13th soon. Um, but I've had a lot of money sitting there for a long time. And, uh, you know, I paid in that scenario, 152,000 per unit in London. Um, it's quite common to get at least 200,000 per unit. Um, and so, you know, it's not super predictable when it comes to getting turnovers, but if I was okay with say getting half of them turned over and I ran those numbers and I was happy with the amount of money out of pocket that I, uh, uh, that I was, then I, then I would, you know, I'd feel okay about it, you know? People can dive a little further into it and start to look at their cash on cash return because at the end of the day, your out of pocket number is also going to be, you know, you're going to be looking for a return on that out of pocket money. Um, But I don't really dive that deep into cash on cash return. I think that, you know, the goal is always infinite. um, But the reality is we're always just looking for as little money left in the deal as possible. Um, And so as little money in the deal as possible with a conservative scenario Mm -hmm. is, uh, is what we're looking for. And just one more last thing on my end, under the underwriting side, um, how do you get comfort in knowing what units you're going to be able to turn over and timeline wise? Like, do you have any assumptions with tenant turnovers? Because that's that's a big part of uh, multifamily investing. Yeah, and I think that it's funny because now property managers are like, "Oh, don't worry about it. You just pay them to leave." Or we haven't had cash for keys conversations with them yet. You can't really trust those things because the reality is they probably have tried to get those tenants out. There's, there's not a lot of people who are just been who these days who have been sitting on units that are super under rented and haven't even tried to get turnovers. Um, and it's going to be more and more the case as time goes on. So um, looking at tenant profile is one of the best ways you can do it. So if they are younger in general, you're more likely to be able to get turnovers. If people are, you know, have been there for, you know, if they're in their fifties and sixties um, and they're, they've been there for 20 years, they're less likely to be moving. So tenant profile is, uh, one of the one of the number one things you can look at. Um, and then you can have a bit of a conversation with people maybe as you're walking through units, you know, and get a feel for, you know, how how likely they are to want to be to want to stick around. Um, but, um, you know, what I honestly do is just budget quite a bit of cash for keys. So, you know, my formula for cash for keys, if anyone's wondering, is um, the delta of the, you know, what the unit could rent for uh, versus what it currently rents for. So let's say it could rent for fifteen hundred a month. Currently, it rents for a thousand a month. Um, you know, one to two years of that difference. So that would be in this scenario, one year would be six thousand dollars of opportunity cost, and two years would be twelve thousand dollars. So twelve thousand dollars would be a perfectly reasonable amount to pay of cash for keys in order to get that turnover because you're getting your money back in two years. Um, and so, in in theory, twelve thousand dollars times the number, you know, or a number that using that calculation, you can figure out how much cash for keys you need to budget in order to get more turnovers on the building. Um, and the longer someone's been there, the more that you're probably going to need to be able to, to pay them to move. And you need to budget for some percentage of people that just won't leave. Um, 
And so, for example, if there's 15 units that you need a turnover on a building, um, maybe maybe plan for five to seven of those units turning over for now uh, as a phase one. And then, you know, maybe at some point you can get 10 of those 15 you know, units turned over. But I would plan for maybe five of those people living there for the rest of the time you own that building because um, it's very possible. Awesome. So we'll move on to the next question here. Which credit lines favor investors the most in terms of maximum capital and good rates? The pro tip with the lines of credit is that uh, you can get with Scotiabank, you can get a credit card. Uh, so you get a, say you have a $20,000 line of credit and a, you get a $5,000 credit card. You can then cancel that credit card and merge that $5,000 of available credit into your unsecured line of credit and bump the bump it up to, I forgot the numbers I used, but you can bump, you can add that $5,000 onto your unsecured line of credit. So um, when it comes to credit unions, they are definitely a local thing. So it depends on where you are. Um, I've worked with Libro Credit Union, Main Street Credit Union, Meridian Credit Union. Um, I've had best luck as of recently with Main Street Credit Union. So if they are willing to work in your market, um, it's definitely worth reaching out. Uh, but realistically, you just want to talk with all of them and uh, be ready to spend some time putting together long applications. They do take quite a th- quite a while, especially the bigger your, your portfolio. It's oftentimes going to take me almost a whole day to put an application together and put all the paperwork, you know, for the whole portfolio together just to hand it over. And maybe it turns out they aren't willing to give me a good offer, but it's worth a shot. Those are a few that I worked with, but it's going to depend on your, your, you know, Desjardins is another good one. A lot of people, they're, they're, they're a little more widely known that work uh, more across Ontario at least. So, oh yeah. And then in terms of like rates and things like that, they tend to be quite similar to, uh, banks, maybe a little bit higher, sometimes even a little bit lower. Um, they've been lower than banks like Scotia Bank. I've seen as of recently, loan to value is going to be more like 75% instead of 80 and amortization is going to be more like 25 instead of 30 year am. Okay. So we're going to move on to an Instagram question. I realize our Instagram isn't linked, so I just, I'm going to write it down here so everyone can see. Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, uh, maybe maybe more like 20%. I mean, it depends. I mean, this really comes down to your ability to estimate renovation costs. So, you know, if you've worked with, you know, an electrician quite often, have that electrician come with you through your, you know, um, initial inspection. Maybe they can give you a better ballpark and get you a little more accurate on your estimation. So I think, you know, if you're not feeling very confident about the level of your, your confidence level when it comes to your estimation, then just add more of a, uh, more of a budget to it. Uh, I'd probably use personally more like 20% for myself. Um, and oftentimes it does go over, uh, <laughs> even these days. So, um, and it's mostly because we open up a wall or whatever it is, and we decide to do more than we planned on. Um, uh, and it's just because once you've started, sometimes it doesn't make sense to just like not fix a plumbing leak or not fix a, not replace plumbing when you have a wall opened up or, you know, you start rewiring a unit and you realize you need to rewire the whole thing instead of just part of it or, you know, whatever. So, um, but you know, the, the goal with getting your estimation costs accurate is, 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 you know, the, the way to get your estimation costs more accurate is to bring in people that, um, will know those numbers more. So bring electrician guy in, make, bring your HVAC guy in, run it by fellow investors to see what their experience is like. Um, yeah. We'll go over one more question in IG, then switch back into Facebook. Do you have conversations with tenants before you close a property? Maybe after you go firm on the property? So you're not really supposed to, right? Um, They're not your tenants, but yeah, you kind of can. Like when you're walking through these units, you know, oh, how long have you been here? How's the building been? You know, you get a bit of a feel for maybe they're like, oh, this place is a crappy. I can't wait to get out of here. Or, you know, a lot of times you'll be like, hey, are you are you you kicking me out? You hear quite often, um, you know, we don't kick anyone out because we can't in Ontario, um, (laughs) even if we wanted to. but, you know, that is a little bit of an indication that maybe they're open to getting paid to move. Um, and so um, and then there's sometimes people are like, you know, you, they're like, no, I, I'm, I'm staying here the rest of my life. I've heard that from plenty of people. Um, so just having a bit of a conversation with people as you walk through, it doesn't have to be, hey, are you staying? Or are you moving or whatever? It's just like, what's your experience been like here? And just kind of, sort of have a bit of a conversation with them and you get a feel for, you know, maybe how how open to this kind of stuff they might be based on their personality type and their life situation. So someone agreed with you, you find they find it easier 
with lenders over six units. What are your thoughts on that? Because that's actually hit or miss. I guess it really depends on the uh, DSCR and acquisition. Yeah. So it depends on your portfolio size. It depends on your income situation. Um, So if you have a large portfolio, you might be more likely to get approval for buildings without needing to have active income. You know, it's going to be based oftentimes quite a bit more on the performance of the building itself and your portfolio itself. Um, You know, six units is kind of an interesting one because, you know, six units itself, you can go to RBC and potentially get 80% loan to value and a 30 year amortization. And, you know, Desjardins would do something quite similar. Um, but yeah, I would say it's just a different ball game. I wouldn't say it's easier or, or not. If you have really great job income, like T4 income, you're probably not going to have too much trouble getting approval for mortgages with something, someone like a bank like Scotia. Um, you know, more and more though, I've actually thought people should consider building a relationship with credit unions a little bit sooner. Um, even while they have active income, because at some point they might not, and then you already built that relationship and now you're starting to qualify using the portfolio itself. Um, or maybe you start to have some kind of active, some kind of active business or something where you're doing something else now, and that, that can potentially help with qualifying as well. Perfect. For financing questions, guys, we're going to focus on more of the multifamily non-financing questions at the moment, because, uh, otherwise we're going to be here forever. There are a ton of questions. You guys can shoot me a DM if you have any financing questions that I put you in touch with someone, or I can try my best to help answer them. So we talked about how to figure out max allowable offer. Now, how do you figure out the ARV of a multifamily property? Now, let's talk not about comps and more so on the income approach. Let's say you're looking at a, an apartment building. Um, so we're looking at a, we're right into it. We're at a 12 unit building or something like that. Um, it's going to be very dependent on the cap rate and the price per unit. Those are going to be your two main things. You know, comparable sales play some role as well. Um, but those comparables are probably going to be based on similar uh, price per unit and cap rate. So You can't often trust the numbers that people are giving you when you're looking at buying a building. Uh, So you need to figure out these numbers yourself. So you can ask for copies uh, of as much as real data as possible. So actual utility bills, actual insurance, property tax numbers, run the, put the real numbers in there. And once you have that, you have the income, you can now figure out your net operating income, just subtract them. And uh, now you have, now you can figure out based on cap rates for your local area, you know, on a, you know, maybe you pick a cap rate range. Um, and so let's say it's in London and maybe you're looking, uh, maybe you're looking in Woodfield neighborhood. So maybe your cap rates between four and a half and five and a half or something like that, or four and five and a half. Um, and so based on that cap rate, you can figure out what the, and based on the net operating income and that cap rate, you have a bit of an idea of the after repair value. You can actually, when you're looking at apartment buildings, one of the best ways to, to know its value is to run it by an appraiser. And so you can actually talk with an appraiser before you even buy a building to say, what's it worth now? And what would it be worth if I brought its, its income up to this and the expenses down to this? And an appraiser will actually, a helpful appraiser will actually, uh, um, you know, give you their estimation of, as to what these things would be worth or say, yeah, you're within the right ballpark if you kind of send them a, your spreadsheet. When I run my profit and loss statements and I get my net operating income, figure out the value of the building based on its cap rate and net operating income. It's very accurate a lot of the time. It's quite similar to what an appraiser would would have to say. And it's because I know what the appraisers are looking for. I know what the lenders are looking for. And so you can often ask both an appraiser and a lender how they tend to value buildings as well. You know, some lenders may want you to budget for more property management fees or less property management fees or, you know, um, so you can Base it on the lender you're planning on working with, the appraiser you're planning on working with, and uh, and figure out the uh, after repair value accordingly. Awesome. We're going to gun through some of these questions here. What would be the best... You guys like to save your questions to the end, eh? <laughs> so what would be the best way to do the research on cities to find the best market? So it's going to be based on your... Um, goals again. So if you're looking for a really high cash flow market, you have to already understand that you're probably going to be in a market that's, you know, maybe a little bit smaller or a little bit rougher or both. So, you know, maybe it's a like Chatham, Ontario is a kind of a rougher market, uh, but there are maybe nicer neighborhoods in Chatham, or maybe there's London, Ontario, which is a bit of a bigger market, but then there's rougher neighborhoods within London. Those honestly, those are some of the neighborhoods I tend to invest in. So like Old East Village, Soho, some of these are a bit rougher. And so you first have to figure out which province you're going to be investing in. 
Um, and so if you're in, investing in Canada and so um, a lot of people, for most people, it's going to be probably Ontario or Alberta. Eastern Canada, I think is quite interesting as well. But let's say it's between those two. You know, now you need to figure out which of those markets do you think you're a little bit more bullish on over the long term. We're, we're guessing at the end of the day, we don't know which one's going to go up in value the most over the long term, but you're kind of at the end of the day, if you're building a long term portfolio, you want to be investing in a market that you feel confident in over the long term. And so I'm obviously in Ontario, but it's also because it's just where I started. And once I have scales of efficiency, I'm just going to keep scaling with what I'm already doing. Ontario, uh, historically, maybe been a little bit more stable than Alberta, which is a little bit more ups and downs, but you can maybe ride through those ups and downs at the right timing and things could work out better. Uh, potentially, you also look at landlord tenant board rules. So, you know, Alberta, you're going to be able to kick tenants out and up the rents to whatever you want, uh, basically once the lease agreement is up. And so there's a lot more flexibility there. And if you just don't feel like dealing with Ontario's rules, you can do that. Uh, there's there's markets out east that allow you to do that as well. Um, so once you've figured out what province you want to invest in, you start to narrow down to um, the city and then the neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> city, again, I would look at population trends. I would look at population in general. So, you know, make sure it's a decent sized city that has a decent amount of, you know, in, like you can look at literally the Wikipedia article for some of these pages, for some of these cities, Not uh, but just any research you can, right? Yeah, what yeah. media is amazing. It gives you the entire history, the breakdown, the schools, the major employers, like everything is on there. Yeah, yeah. And there's, and, and you know, Government of Canada actually provides a lot of good stats on population trends and income and all sorts of these things as well. You can look at crime maps. You can, you can gather all sorts of data. Um, and, you know, you know, I would, I wouldn't look at crime maps too deeply, but they're worth taking a peek at, you know, you know, anything downtown is going to have higher crime. It's anything with a denser population is going to have higher crime. Um, but, uh, you know, that's at a bit of a high level, uh, I guess, how I would do some of the research on finding the right market, but then, you know, looking at average deals in those markets, what they cash flow, you know, based on what your goals are with cash flow, and then looking at neighborhoods that have the zoning you want that allow for the types of multifamily buildings you want to take on. Um, the age of the building that makes you comfortable. Maybe you prefer purpose-built versus, uh, you know, converted dwellings. I tend to have a lot of converted dwellings, which are quirky, but you can add quite a bit of value to them, which is really well-suited for bird deals. It's quite a conversation to have. And then I think it's, you know, it's worth talking with other investors in those markets to hear their experience as well um, and which which neighborhoods they like to invest in. And, uh, you know, I think that gets you a, a pretty good start. Yeah, no, amazing. I guess uh, one important point you mentioned is like, what's your goal ultimately, right? Because if you only have twenty thousand to forty thousand dollars saved, you're not investing anywhere close to the GTA or many major cities. So that's sort of also going to push you in, in what markets you can and can't invest. Do you use realtors or, or do you find these off market properties yourself? Actually, let's talk about finding these deals, these multifamily deals. How do you go about it? Yeah, and before I do that, if you only have twenty grand, you could probably still do five percent down in a in a half decent sized market. So twenty twenty five grand, I'll actually get you into a decent sized market um, with that strategy, and it gets the ball rolling. But yeah, in terms of finding deals, um, half my portfolio has been on market, half of it's been off market, uh, approximately. You know, when you get into larger multifamily, it's really a networking game. It's quite a bit different than small multifamily. So for me, as of more recently, it's been talking with. Realtors who tend to have more pocket listings um, and things like that when it comes to on market slash semi on market, you know, anything through a realtor is sort of kind of a, on a market of some sort. When it comes to off market stuff, you can actually like literally sit in the driveway of an apartment building, right? And try to get the phone number of the owner from one of the tenants walking into the building, or you can look at the management company uh, who generally have a sign posted in the lobby of these buildings um, and call that number. You can call, if you're remote, you can call all of the property management companies on Google and see if you can get in touch with a property manager that's willing to have a conversation and maybe incentivize them with some kind of a finder's fee if they connect you with the owner and you end up buying the building. So I've bought buildings like that, apartment buildings, by connecting with property managers and then connecting me with the owner. So that's a really good one. You can actually look at even just rental ads so if a unit's up for rent, uh, well, now you know there's a vacant unit and you have the owner's phone number or the property manager's phone number. So call them up and see if you can get a deal done. Um, you know, they're initially going to be expecting it's, it's a potential tenant calling uh, or an applicant. But, you know, you just say, no, I'm a landlord or I'm an owner or 
you know, I'm an investor and I just wanted to see if I could potentially buy this building privately. Off market's really great because you can actually buy properties for under market value and you can be completely open and honest with the seller about how you're able to do that because they don't have to pay commission right off the bat. And you can take 4% off the market value and it's already a win-win. Um, mm-hmm. And off-market sellers, they like the privacy of it all. Oftentimes, oftentimes these buildings that really uh, have a lot of value to be added are probably also just pretty run down. So the owners might be a little bit embarrassed. Uh, they might be embarrassed about the tenant profile in their buildings as well. So they don't like the idea of necessarily having this public listing where people are walking through their building. Um, so they actually oftentimes prefer to sell these things privately. And that's also the reason why you want to talk to realtors because realtors are shopping these things out a little bit more privately as well. You don't really see a lot of apartment buildings listed on the MLS and it's because they tend to transact amongst a, a group of people, uh, you know, a small list of buyers in each city, really. Question about your 24 unit. Is it one or two bedrooms? And to add on to that, how much does bedroom mix actually matter to you? It matters a lot to me. Um, the two bedroom units are just, they rent for so much more. Uh, and and here, I think 60%, maybe a little bit more, 65% maybe of the 24 units. I don't know why I'm using percentages. It's probably like 15 or 16 of the units have two bedrooms uh, in this 24 unit. I f- forget exactly what it is. Um, and that was a big part of what attracted me to it because I can get quite a bit more rent for the two bedrooms. And so it's not just price per unit when you're looking at these apartment buildings. It's, you know, how many bedrooms are in these units? It's actually one of the first questions I ask when I'm analyzing a deal. Uh, how many bedrooms are in these units? Because you can make a pretty quick estimation as to what these units could rent for. Um, and uh, so, yeah, mostly two bedrooms. And that's that was on purpose. Are you considering buying side of Ontario due to, due to the landlord tenant board? So it's definitely the most annoying part of investing in Ontario. Um, but that being said, you know, the money is often made where the problems are. Um, and so if you know how to solve those problems, that's where you make your money. And I know how to solve a lot of these problems. And so I'm happy to take those problems on and figure it out. Um, it's not the craziest thing to say, I'm going to put 20 grand aside per tenant and know that if needed, we could pay those tenants to move, you know, and there's a good chance people accept a payment like that. And so if you buy a really great deal, you can often budget for those sorts of things. Um, and so I, I'm, I think that like similar to why not invest in some small town in the States where the cash flow is amazing and whatever, I, I feel a little bit more confident about the long-term values of Ontario real estate. And I think that the fact that it's harder to transact in, it lends to some degree to its value. Um, and so uh, I think that every market is just like a different board game. So you have a new set of rules and it's just a different way of winning. Uh, there's just a different way to win and new strategies to try in that market. But uh, um, I think that if you have the tools to make money in a market, um, it's really about identifying those problems and then finding the solutions, just like any business. List out all of the problems that people have and then figure out what the solutions to those are. Um, mm-hmm. And so I am not considering investing outside of Ontario, um, to be completely clear. Um, uh, you know, I... I would say half of the reason is because of scales of efficiency. I already have my whole portfolio here and it's working and I'm going to continue doing what's already working. Uh, the other, other part of the reason is personally, I prefer to own real estate in Ontario versus other parts of Canada. And uh, some of these smaller markets and things like that in the States, um, I think that there's a reason the property values are lower. It's because they haven't seen uh, the appreciation that we've seen here. And uh, part of that is going to be supply and demand. Part of that is going to be government and things like that. I think it's very likely that we see in the coming 10 years plus another massive stimulation that the government prints a bunch of money again and it jacks up the value of buildings. I think it's extremely likely that that happens at some point along the lines. It'll be very disappointing for our country. Um, But uh, when it comes to owning assets, you know that it increases their value. So, I mean, if you're going to... you know, if we already know this is going to happen, why not own some assets? Lots of investors are going belly up. How can you avoid that? That's a, I, I I love that question, man. I mean, it's it, the list is uh, the list is getting longer. Um, of of uh, the tide is the tide has gone out on quite a few investors at this point. There's a lot of people. I'm not going to name names just because I don't I don't feel like it. Um, but there's a lot of people you guys probably used to follow on Instagram that aren't on Instagram anymore. 
Um, and there's been lots of bankruptcies. There's been lots of uh, people running into issues. And I think that part of the reason, at least that, that I haven't run into those issues is one of the reasons is I had no partners. So that was pretty valuable because I could make all the decisions I needed that were best for my portfolio. Uh, another part of the reason was uh, high cash flow portfolio. So I had a long wait for cash flow. To I was, I was cash flowing like 17 grand a month uh, on my portfolio and it dropped down to the negatives <laughs> in that time. So, um, you know, with interest rates. So, you know, if I was zero, it would have dropped into the very far negative and that would have been a big problem. So that's one of the values in high cash flow portfolios. When rates were low, you know, 2%, they better cash flow well. Now that they're like 7% or whatever, you know, your people are looking at, it's okay if they're cash flow neutral or so, or make a little bit of money or even maybe burn a little bit as long as you have cash reserves and liquidity. Um, but cash flow was another reason. Not being too high leverage was another one of the another big reasons. So I didn't have a bunch of super high leverage uh, mortgages. Um, I was generally working with credit unions for the most part. I had some promissory notes. I actually had more than I wanted, which I touched on upon or touched upon earlier. And so I paid a lot of those off by selling a couple of my buildings just to stabilize. Um, I also have had a strong emphasis on units on turning my units over. That's what we have to do as investors is get, is get the income up on our buildings. That's how we add value. Um, and so how can you guys avoid it? Make sure that your properties are, um, you know, in, in this, like I said, with current interest rates, cash flow neutral-ish or positive, ideally. Make sure you're adding value through strategic renovations. Make sure you're buying under market value. So get really great deals to begin with. Try not to get too messy with your partnership structures and things like that. If you can, maybe invest without partners. If you do have partners, just make sure you're on the same page and that they fully trust you and that you have it all documented properly. So if you do need to exit the partnership, you have it structured properly. And Austin could probably talk way more about that stuff. Yeah, just don't get too high leverage. Don't borrow too much private debt. The Some of the people that are still around that have scaled large portfolios without partners probably have a giant, giant pile of private debt and... I don't recommend going there either because I think that's where the tide has yet to gone out, uh, has yet to go out <laughs> um, to some degree, unfortunately. So I think, and if you're in that position yourself, just know how difficult it is to unwind large amounts of private debt. Um, it's quite difficult. Uh, I know because I've gone through it myself. And so try not to take too much of it on. If you have a bunch of it, consider selling some buildings, pay some of these loans off, um, just get back and stabilize, put your ego to the side. You know, maybe your portfolio is half the size, but you can you can withstand these times. Mm -hmm. Very good points. How important is structured due diligence and required timeline so you don't have to go back for extension? And what, what um, type of due diligence do you do as well when you uh, put a new multifamily under contract? Yeah, so, I mean, set your timeline. I mean, it depends on what due diligence you're doing. You need to get through the building. You need to have the people you need go through the building. You need your appraiser to get in there as well. Um, and so, you know, have as many showings as you need structured into your APS so that your, your plumber can walk through it, your electrician can walk through it, your HVAC guy, your appraiser. Maybe you want, like in a perfect world, you have enough time on your conditional period to get the financing approved or at least well on its way and looking promising. Um, so if you're looking at a fourplex or something like that, maybe 10 to 14 days kind of thing. If you're looking at a large apartment building, it could be two, three, maybe four weeks. I mean, not a lot of people are going to be happy about a conditional period that's that long. A lot of times you can actually do a bunch of your due diligence before you're conditional, um, which is the way I've tended, uh, I tend to do it historically. Um, and so my conditional periods have always been quite short because uh, oftentimes my, my offers are firm actually. Um, and it's because I do my due diligence for a couple of weeks and then I go in firm. Um, so it all depends on your speed and the availability of the people you need to walk through your buildings and you know, I'll click your lawyer and your lender and all these people are to get back to you. But, you know, I've definitely made plenty of mistakes, you know, um, uh, when it came to even my 24 unit apartment building, you know, I walked in and I saw 24 hydrometers and I was like, this is fantastic. They all have separate panels. They all have separate meters. Yeah. They're fuse panels, but I can swap those out. It turned out, uh, I think the, I forget if it was 40 or 60 amp, maybe 40, I think per unit. Um, so 40 amps per unit sucks. Um, so we had to rewire basically everything, uh, <laughs> not the units themselves necessarily, which is good. The wiring in the units. Okay. But we had to put new panels in new meters and new feeder cables from the panels to all of the units. 
uh, which was very expensive, you know, like 50 grand or something like that. Right. And so definitely have your electrician walk through. I've probably said that a few times because it's a mistake I've made. <laughs> so uh, just bring, you know, it's, it's all about who, not how, if you don't know how to do yourself, bring someone in who does, um, you know, if you have a fellow investor or mentor that you can have run these things by, that's a huge way to save yourself a ton of money. You know, one good decision can save or make you 20, 50 grand, a uh, hundred grand easily. So the bigger you're getting as an investor, the more properties you have, the bigger decisions you're making, the more important it is that you're running it by people who have experience in that already. And if let's say the realtor or the homeowner gives you a pro forma, what type of due diligence are you doing there? If they just give you a bunch of like documents, because as you mentioned, yeah. I think earlier on, you can always take them at face value. Yeah, you basically can't at all. So like, you know, all the, 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 the hydro cost is this much, the gas is this much. I mean, I might start with those numbers uh, and see if, you know, as my initial, you know, first pass filter. But then once you're in your actual deeper due diligence period, you need to get copies of the actual bills and run the real numbers. Um, you know, even if they give you the property taxes, call the city and ask for the property taxes. That was actually a mistake, a big mistake. I made a lot of mistakes on this one building, but my 24 unit building, um, I called the city and said, what is the property tax on this address? And this address has, unfortunately, or confusingly, it has two addresses. And they only gave me the property tax for one of those addresses. And I thought it was for the whole building. And so the property taxes were double what I expected, even after I verified it with the city. And it was because the person I called on, uh, on the line didn't. So that dramatically affected my month to month cash flow. So um, these are all mistakes I've made that I'm definitely uh, just trying to help other people avoid themselves because they're costly mistakes. How can you check if all the tenants are paying? I guess this goes into due diligence. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I, honestly, I don't, I don't know if there's a better way to go about this than the way I do it. Um, but you know, you have a clause saying that the tenants are in good standing. You get like some kind of, you get like documentation from the from the owner showing the payments, and you hope that they're accurate. I mean. At that point, you maybe talk to your lawyer to make sure that you have something to go back on if there, if it turns out, oh, one of these tenants was six months behind and the owner didn't mention that. I mean, I think that that's misrepresentation. I think there's a decent chance you could make a case there. Um, so maybe, uh, and Austin, maybe you could add to this or maybe someone else in the comments could, but I think it's uh, it's really about saying, you know, hey, you, the information you're providing is real and accurate. And if it's not, we can... We, we might come after you for it. So share real information <laughs> and then do your best to yeah. for, for tenants paying. I mean, I don't know how much you could, you can't go into their bank account and make sure. So. Yeah, I guess it's just like getting your lawyer to make some more bulletproof conditions. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. If you can get money plus it's going to lead to our turnover, you can sort of look at it as a win, but that's only if you have those conditions set up. Well, and, and one side note is what's interesting is when you inherit tenants, you also inherit arrears. Uh, and so, and you want to run this by your lawyer to make sure that you're, that you're wording your APS, your agreement of purchase and sale, uh, offer letter properly. But if you have a tenant, if they have a tenant that's owes 10, that owes $10,000 because they've, they haven't paid rent in however long, they now should own, owe you that $10,000. And so I've had that scenario uh, with tenants before and I inherited a building and so they owe you. So you, so it's good. Some it's honestly, it's a really good thing if the tenants in arrears, when you, uh, when you take on a building, because you hold some cards in that scenario, you can go after them for the arrears. You can forgive the arrears in order in exchange for an N11 to get a turnover. Yeah. Those things are honestly in, in Ontario, you kind of want tenants to be behind the rent <laughs> if they're, uh, if they're a unit that you want turned over. At this point in your career, how often do you try? I assume that's like how often do you acquire properties? I, that's my assumption on this question. I've been in a stabilization period for quite a while. I bought a triplex a few months, a couple months ago or a few months ago. Um, but that was the only property I think I bought in 2023. Um, there was a decision I made maybe a year and a half ago or maybe a couple of years ago. And I said, you know, if I get another chunk of money uh, from a refinance or whatever it might be, say it's a hundred grand. Would I rather put that toward a down payment on another building or would I rather get, say, 10 turnovers on my buildings? And I would much rather get 10 turnovers. So I decided let's use that money to put toward cash for keys and potentially renovations. Um, a lot of times these turnovers, you can just paint units and re-rent them or clean them up. And so I've just been in a stabilization period for quite a while, turning units over, getting rents up. 
um, adding units. So some units we turned over, we were able to split them into two different units. So that adds a quite a bit of value to the building. And so when it comes to, you know, um, further acquisitions, um, Right now, my at my, at my point, the, the point I'm at in my career, my number one goal is lifestyle, uh, and so I've realized during these times one of the biggest lessons I learned uh, is, you know, the value of peace of mind. And so when rates went up and values, I didn't really care so much about values dropping, but when rates are going up, you want you're looking at your burn rate, you're looking at whatever you want to make sure you can ride through these times. And so now, lifestyle being my number one goal probably going to go in with a little even less leverage than I was going in at because I want to really be in this in the long term. I want to own my buildings 20 years from now. And it's so funny because I used to say that seven years ago. So, you know, I'm getting closer to the 10 year mark already with some of my buildings. I think that, you know, if we see interest rates drop, we're going to see a frenzy of people refinancing and re-leveraging. And I think that people need to be a little careful because we just learned this lesson. <laughs> and so <Yeah. laughs> uh, if and when this time comes, don't get too crazy with refinances and private debt. And, you know, we just learned this lesson. So uh, I think that's, you know, I'm going to continue with acquisitions, but I'm probably going to be a little less crazy about it. I mean, I, I in 2021, I bought 51 units. I'm not going to do that again that quickly. Um, <laughs> that's uh, that's where I'm at. Okay. We have a couple of more questions. I guess it's more of a statement. I wonder how useful ChatGPT4 would be uh, for a state of Yeah. Probably will be. I think it's just, yeah, I would use that for sure. Yeah. I mean, verify the information you get from it, but as a quick rule of thumb or a quick analysis, um, yeah, I would totally, I use it all the time. ChatGPT is so so useful for so many things. How much investment do you need to get started anywhere in Ontario? Uh, I guess that's how much money you need to get started in investing. Yeah, if it's your first deal, again, I try to get into a place like a duplex of 5% down or a triplex or fourplex with 10% down. You do need to you need to move into or you need to state your intention to see to CMHC to move into a building. And so if you live in a different city, uh, stating that intention can be a little bit more difficult. Maybe you're going to move to that city and move into a new house. But the narrative needs to be there so the bank understands that's your plan. If you ten, if you move out a week later, that's fine. Uh, there's no you know, you're not breaking any rules at that point. You decide the house isn't for you and you moved out. You still get to keep that 5% down financing situation. So um, I would really look for something like that um, in order to get in with less of your own money. Um, but uh, if you're not planning on doing that, then you're going to be looking at 20% down on whatever market um, you're looking to invest in. So um, yeah, just have to run those numbers. Awesome. Two more questions here and then we'll wrap up, guys. Um, I guess this is a common insurance cost, LOL. That's when you're talking about overstating expenses. Uh, understating insurance is always the one that gets overstated. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, like, oh, I only pay 2000 a month. You're like, hmm. <laughs> okay, here, IG question. Any tips for finding high quality tenants? Anything you do in your screening process that makes a big difference? I don't do this stuff anymore. Honestly, one of the biggest things that added value for me was hiring leasing agents. Uh, so, you know, friends of mine own tailored rentals in London. If you're in London, tailored rentals is awesome. Uh, Justin Alara, um, they're fantastic. They did a better job I ever did, uh, than I ever did at screening tenants, but you know, uh, pulling their credit score, making sure they're a good fit for the unit. Just a quick note. I tend to really avoid three bedrooms and up. Um, I try to avoid buying buildings with three units and up. And if I do, I try to convert them to, you know, maybe a two bed and a bachelor or things like that. It's hard to find quality tenants for three bedroom units and up. You end up with just too many people in the unit causing too many issues potentially. So really try to stick with one and two bedroom apartments and then your screening process is going to be quite a bit easier. You know, actually meet these tenants, get a feel for them when you're actually chatting with them. Make sure their income is, you know, um, I don't know what, at least double their, uh, um, you know, rent, but ideally more. Um, it's, it's getting harder and harder these days. The numbers used to, they had a lot more buffer built into them, but rents have gone up so much and income hasn't. So, you know, if they have a dog, you can consider asking them to bring the dog to the showing, um, or maybe even send you a photo or a video or something like that. You're allowed to say we don't allow pets, but if they end up getting a pet, you're not allowed kicking them out for that reason. So you need to do that screening initially. My friends, Justin Alara at Taylor Rentals, they're actually making a whole course on tenant screening. So, um, I would keep an eye out for that. I think it'd be really great. I actually have a section 
from them in my multifamily mastery course, all about tenant screening as well. But uh, I stopped doing that stuff myself a long time ago. Um, I honestly, I didn't do a very good job with it. <laughs> like I, I, I think the biggest reason I didn't do a good job with it, I wasn't very patient. And so the number one tip is just be patient. Are oh, you willing to yeah. take vacancy? <laughs> Yeah, because I knew, I always I knew that I was like, ah, this is not going to be a good tenant, but I don't want to leave a u- the unit vacant for another month. They were always the problem. So sometimes you can use your gut more than you think. I think all of the points you said makes a lot of sense. Sort of when I was, it depends on the market you're investing in as well. So understand that. Like when I invest in Sudbury, I True. think I held my criteria way too high. I was waiting for someone with 700 credit score minimum and i and i realized like you know what like that's i'm going to be waiting forever there's not very often you find people with wow. that. So i think you sort of have to adjust your expectations one thing i've learned as well is is that always monitor who your competition is and the the in just you told me you were reasonable go online and i see units much better than roughly around the same price or sitting for roughly around the same price and it just like acknowledging it's like, okay, you know, if a good tenant comes along, they're probably going to take that unit over mine. So I think monitoring competition is pretty understated in, in the current market too. What has been the biggest bottleneck in your journey and what are your thoughts investing in the state with uh, tenant friendly rules? Honestly, like if people are going to be, if people are looking for tenant friendly, you know, situations, you could look at Alberta, you could look at Eastern Canada. These things are quite similar. Um, you don't necessarily have to go out of country. I think that again, you can make money in in any market with any strategy. So just or with, but you can't make. Yeah, I already said that. But you can make money in the states using different strategies if you like. There's a million different markets. There's a million different strategies, and you can apply those things in the states. And uh, it it'd probably have to be a little bit more of a specific question if I could really help there. But when it comes to my the biggest bottleneck in my journey, capital is always a big one. Um, it wasn't really my biggest bottleneck though, to be honest. My deals were good, um, so I was always able to pull a good, pull a, most of my money back out or more. Um, stress tolerance—it's <laughs> probably one of the biggest bottlenecks. Like you know, I think that you know it's part of the reason I was able to scale relatively quick because I actually built a stress. To- I built quite thick skin in this game, and I entered into the space of real estate investing with pretty thick skin to begin with. A lot of the tenant issues that really caused people to lose sleep at night didn't really bother me quite as much. So I was, I was built for a little bit more. Uh, although if that's whatever your bottleneck is, bring someone in, like maybe a property manager is now there managing your tenants. Now that's no longer your bottleneck because the tenants aren't causing you stress. I think it's really figure out what your bottleneck is and then just look for the solution to that. Um, but I can't even really think of what a good bottleneck was for, for me other than, uh, yeah, other than just like opportunity overload and just trying to figure out like, how to maintain focus and manage stress during uh, during significant times of scale. Because there's a lot to think about. Every time you, I remember the first two, three properties, four properties, it felt like I was living a new life for each property I bought. Um, and so that's not for everyone, but I really I actually kind of enjoyed that. But, you, you know, you tend to burn out. I know I burnt out in, I forget what year it was, but um, I burnt out. I went on a social media blackout for a year. Um, and I was just comparing myself too much with other people, even with everything I felt like I was doing quite well. Um, and I'm sure there was plenty of people comparing themselves with my journey and I was doing the same thing. So, uh, you know, I think be really cognizant of the people that you're, that you're following, the people you're learning from, and you'll be a lot less likely to, a lot more likely to avoid burnout if you're focusing on your own journey instead of trying to accomplish the goals that other people have for themselves and they're not your goals. Very good point. And I think relatable to a lot of people, especially newer investors coming in now, because it's much hard. Reality is it's harder to get started today than it was when we got started. Right. Then this, no- and this is what this is why community is. I think people are really starving for community these days. I think that good quality community is really important. You know, you guys have rise, which is awesome. Um, but it's really about being around people who 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 understand what you're going through and can relate and you can be a little more realistic around about the people that you're uh, the people that are surrounding you and the average of the five people around you. I'm going to be doing more, a lot more community stuff. You know, I have my mastermind. I'm going to do a free community soon. So definitely keep an eye out because I think that's something that people are really starving for. Awesome. Um, last question here, actually, when you are acquiring new properties, do you always put 20% down? And I let's assume residential for the most part. 
Yeah. So at this point, I have to do 25% down on everything at least because that's what the minimum requirement is for okay. credit unions. Um, but yeah, for for the first 10 properties, uh, for the for properties 2 to 10, uh, it was 20% down on everything. You know, I bought a property recently with a vendor take back mortgage. So it was only 10% down because the seller held the rest of the mortgage. And so it was only in that scenario, it was $40,000 out of pocket for a triplex. And so vendor take backs are a way that you can definitely get into properties with less than 20% down. And of course, you can borrow money and do these types of things. But at the end of the day, yeah, when it comes to traditional financing and banks and stuff like that, 20 to 25% down is uh, typically the minimum. Perfect. You know what? There was one more question that came in on Instagram that I just saw. I don't want to leave them hanging. Um, yeah. Before we get into that, someone asked, who was a good property management in London? Why don't you drop it in the Facebook group, Kellen, after we jump off of this live so people can see it on there too? It's definitely difficult to find good property management companies. I've been very happy with the people I work with. Um, so there's a company in London called Bloom. They've been really great uh, for me. Uh, and I know that it's, and I say that because I know that a lot of people really struggle to find good property management companies. So if you guys do reach out to them, feel free to mention my name. They've been really great for for me. Which was the leasing company again? The leasing company is Tailored Rentals. They were they're good friends of mine, and like I said, they're fantastic. So I think that's a really good option for people who are self managing but don't want to do the tenant screening and uh, placement part of things. Um, so yeah, Tailored Rentals, they're awesome. On Instagram. How much time does it take to find a multi-family deal? Well, I showed my uh, I showed my journey of like how how many buildings I bought per year. So you know maybe only two to three properties per year or something like that. I think it was for me. So you know every four to six months. Uh, you know you really don't have to find that many. Uh, you don't have to find a, a whole list of deals. You just have to find one good deal every once in a while. So uh, I would say yeah, every four to six months is a perfectly reasonable rate to buy, you know, maybe every 12 months, maybe every 24 months. And that's fine. If you buy one property every year or two, you're going to be doing just fine over the long term. Awesome. And that wraps up today's uh, multifamily Q&A. Kellen, really appreciate you jumping on. I know we went over time. Yeah, no, hey, I, I appreciate it, guys. Um, hopefully this was helpful. Um, you got my website there on the bottom. There's a free calculator you guys can have. You know, when you're looking to, to buy a burr deal it's all about running those burr numbers and so that's what that calculator is for but you know anyone that grabs that calculator um i'll be sending you other good free stuff soon uh, and I, like i said the community and things like that so definitely uh follow along on my instagram and uh lots of good free information on there thank you to everyone who has tuned in in today's first monthly q a again with our multifamily expert kellen james as kellen mentioned his website is down below for the free burr calculator uh, would love to hear your guys' feedback as well. So make sure to shoot me uh, an Instagram DM on ways to improve this uh, going forward as well. Again, this is sort of our first go. Glad you guys all enjoyed. Until next time, everyone, invest smarter and live better. Take care, all. Appreciate it, Kellen.